Spring 1943, at Los Alamos. I was 24, barely past my PhD, surrounded by legends like Fermi and Bohr. To most people, I was nobody, except one man who quietly saw something different. Without telling me, Oppenheimer wrote a single letter that would change the arc of my life. All these years later, I still wonder what he saw and why it mattered so much. The train pulled into Lamy, New Mexico in the spring of 1943. I was 24, carrying a battered suitcase and a stack of physics notebooks. My wife Arlene was already gravely ill, tuberculosis, with no cure in sight. Oppenheimer found her a place in a sanatorium near Albuquerque, a hundred miles from the lab. He did not have to do that, but he did. That gesture alone told me something about the kind of leader he was. Los Alamos itself felt unfinished. Dusty roads, barracks hammered together in a hurry, fences everywhere. The air was thin, the work relentless. I had just left Princeton, not even a year past my thesis. Suddenly, I was named a group leader in the theoretical division under Hans Bethe. It was absurd, really. Around me were men whose names filled textbooks, Enrico Fermi, Niels Bohr, Edward Teller. Most were decades older, many already famous. I was the youngest group leader at the whole site. The lab ran on ideas, not rank. If your argument made sense, it got a hearing. That suited me. I never cared much for titles. I argued with anyone if the physics did not add up. Some thought I was brash, but Niels Bohr, the great Dane himself, started asking for me in meetings. He said he wanted someone who would argue honestly, not just nod along. I did not realize it then, but that kind of attention was rare. Still, most days I felt like an imposter, just a kid with a knack for calculations, trying to keep up with giants, worrying about a hospital bed two hours down the road. The only thing I knew for sure, I wanted to do the work right. For Arlene, for the team, for the world. Oppenheimer called me into his office one morning. He had heard about my fussing over safety margins, about how I kept pestering the engineers with questions they did not want to answer. He looked at me, half smiling, and said, yes, little Richard, you go in there and do that. It was not a suggestion. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was where they were enriching uranium for the bomb. The place ran around the clock, with hundreds of workers, miles of pipes, vats of material nobody had ever handled in those quantities before. The people running the plant were smart, but most had never seen a chain reaction, except on paper. They did not always understand how close they might be to an accident. At 24, I was supposed to be the expert. My job was to walk through the plant, ask uncomfortable questions, and figure out whether their day-to-day -day routines were safe. I started with the basics. How much uranium could you pile together before it became dangerous? What shapes were they storing it in? How close were the containers? I ran the numbers, sometimes right there in a noisy warehouse, chalk in hand. I told the engineers, no more big tanks. Use long, thin pipes instead. Never stack more than a set number of drums together. Keep everything spaced out, even if it slowed production. The rules had to be simple enough that nobody could forget them in a rush. Some did not like a kid from Los Alamos telling them how to run their plant. But Oppenheimer had made it clear, if I said something was unsafe, that was the end of the discussion. They changed tank designs, rewrote their procedures, and during the war, Oak Ridge never had a criticality accident. That trust, Oppenheimer's willingness to put real responsibility in my hands, meant more to me than any title could. On November 4, 1943, Oppenheimer sat down at his desk in Los Alamos and wrote a letter to Raymond T. Burge, the head of physics at Berkeley. He did not mention it to me. In fact, I would not hear about it until many years later. But that single page changed the course of my life in ways I could not imagine at the time. Oppenheimer's words were plain, but they carried a weight I still feel. He wrote, He is by all odds the most brilliant young physicist here and everyone knows this. That was me, Richard Feynman, age 25, just months out of Princeton, still worried I might be in over my head. Oppenheimer did not stop at ability. He described my character, my way of working with others, 
my engaging personality, as he put it. He wanted Burge to know that I was not just a theorist buried in equations. I could work with engineers, with Nobel laureates, with anyone who cared about the science. He even quoted Hans Bethe. Beth has said that he would rather lose any two other men than Feynman from this present job. And then there was the line that followed me for years. He is a second Dirac, only this time human. That was Eugene Wigner's description, putting me in the same league as Paul Dirac, but hinting at a warmth that set me apart. Oppenheimer sent that letter to Berkeley, urging them to move quickly if they wanted me after the war. I had no idea. I was just doing the work, trying to keep people safe, trying to keep up. But in that moment, Oppenheimer put his own name on the line for me. He saw something I had not yet seen in myself. If stories like this matter to you, the human side of physics, subscribe for more. Paul Dirac was a legend long before I ever set foot in Los Alamos. He shared the 1933 Nobel Prize for his work on quantum mechanics, and his equations predicted the existence of antimatter, an idea so strange it sounded like science fiction at the time. But Dirac was almost as famous for his silences as for his math. He could sit in a room full of physicists and say nothing for an hour, then quietly point out a flaw in someone's argument with a single sentence. People used to joke that a conversation with Dirac was like talking to a stone wall, except the wall might answer if you waited long enough. His brilliance was never in doubt, but you did not go to him for encouragement or a laugh. When Oppenheimer compared me to Dirac, it was both a compliment and a challenge. Dirac represented the highest level of theoretical insight, a mind that could see through the fog of equations to the heart of the problem. But he was also distant, almost untouchable. Oppenheimer's letter did not just say I could keep up with Dirac on the blackboard. He wanted people to know that I brought something else to the table, a willingness to explain, to argue, to listen, and to connect. The physics mattered, but so did humanity. The way you treated people, that was the difference Oppenheimer saw. And it shaped the way I tried to do science from then on. Arlene died in Albuquerque on June 16, 1945. One month later, I stood in the desert and watched the first atomic bomb turn the night sky white. After the war, I tried to lose myself in the work, but everything felt hollow. Then came the Pocono Conference in 1948, a gathering of the best minds in physics, men whose names had filled my notebooks back at MYT. I was invited to present my new approach to quantum electrodynamics, something I had worked out in lonely hours at Cornell. My diagrams were strange, lines and squiggles that mapped out how particles interacted. Most in the room looked puzzled. Bohr, always the sharpest critic, pressed me hard. He wanted to know if these pictures were just clever tricks, or if they captured something real about nature. I stood at the blackboard, sweating trying to explain how every path counted, how the math matched the experiments. The questions kept coming. I answered as honestly as I could, admitting what I did not know, defending what I did. When the session ended, there was no applause, just a quiet murmur as the giants shuffled out. But I had held my ground. Years later, those diagrams would become the language of particle physics. In that moment, I realized Oppenheimer's letter was not a prediction. It was a challenge. Could I live up to the trust he placed in me, even when no one else understood what I was trying to say? In the early hours of October 20, 1965, the phone rang in my Pasadena apartment. On the line was a voice from Stockholm, calm and formal, telling me I had been awarded the Nobel Prize in physics. I sat on the edge of the bed, listening to the words, trying to make sense of them. The prize was shared with Schwinger and Tomonaga for our work on quantum electrodynamics, the very ideas I had once tried to defend on a blackboard at the Pocono Conference, surrounded by the best minds in the world. For a moment, the years between Los Alamos and that call seemed to collapse. I thought of Oppenheimer's letter, 
written long before the world cared who I was, and of all the times I had doubted whether I belonged among the giants. The Nobel was not a finish line. It was a quiet nod from the world, a confirmation that the trust placed in me all those years ago had not been misplaced. Today, breakthroughs still hinge on the courage to spot potential before it's obvious. Oppenheimer's letter reminds us that one act of belief can redirect the course of science and change a life. Thanks for sharing this moment with me.